High in the bright cloudless sky, the dragons fought. Their battle cries shattered the early morning stillness as razor-sharp claws and massive teeth sought the fragile wings of their foes. Many riders were already near exhaustion from fighting off attacks from all sides and guiding their mounts through the melee. The many different coloured dragons, wheeling and circling, diving and attacking, were like a kaleidoscope, beautiful and terrible. Soon, only the strongest and the most cunning would be left to fight for the Dragonlance and the ultimate victory. Hello and welcome to Always Bored, Never Boring. Recently, I celebrated reaching 20,000 subscribers on the channel, and I thought a good way to commemorate would be reviewing a board game based on an intellectual property that is also currently celebrating. That property is Dragonlance, the game is Dragonlance... a uh, game. Not TSR's most original title. The first Dragonlance novels and modules were published in 1984, which means 2024 marks their 40th anniversary, and that makes me feel very old. However, the game we are looking at today wasn't published until 1988. That's three years after Dungeon Quest, but a year before Hero Quest. It is a game of fantastical dragon-based aerial combat in which teams of winged mythical beasts vie for control of the legendary Dragonlance. And if you think I'm going to open this box and start talking about the game without first taking a moment to draw attention to the cover art, you are very much mistaken. Heck, if this game was absolutely terrible, which I don't think it is, there's a good chance I would have it in my collection just because of this masterful piece of badass art. This is from the brush of Jeff Easley, a man who has breathed life into countless rules books and modules for Dungeons and & Dragons and dozens of Magic the Gathering cards. This particular piece of art has done its fair share of heavy lifting. In addition to being the cover of this game, it was the cover for the novel Legend of Humor and the cover for the video game Heroes of the Lance, all of which came out in 1988. I discovered Dragonlance game, hereafter referred to as just Dragonlance, when I was at school. If we hop in the Wayback Machine and we skip along my timeline, we can peep out the window and see me almost completely ignoring this game. You see, my school had organised a kind of summer youth club. We had all been encouraged to sign up for different activities over the course of a two-week period. So I did swimming for a couple of days, and golf for a couple of days, and even studying for a couple of days, which involved sitting in the library waiting to go home. But for three days, I got to be in the games club, where older kids brought in amazing games like Dungeon Quest, Dragonlance, and Space Hulk. And while most of these students gathered in a corner of the room to play Sonic on the Mega Drive, I played board games. That was one of the only times I enjoyed being at school. It was in that weird club that I truly fell in love with Dungeon Quest, the game that I went on to play for most of those three days, diving back into the maze time and time again and marvelling at the many ways my poor heroes would die. And it was because of Dungeon Quest's excellence that I somewhat overlooked Dragonlance's charm. I did play it, I did really enjoy it, it just wasn't Dungeon Quest. Nevertheless, even though I only played Dragonlance briefly during that fateful games club, it clearly left an impression, because many years later, I hunted out a copy and purchased it for my collection. The copy we are reviewing today. The big question is, viewed today as something more than a piece of nostalgia, does this game soar like a dragon, or is it a bit of a donkey? Dragonlance is a 2-6 player skirmish game for ages 10 and up, and one of the big features is it has two levels of play, so you can get started straight away with the basic rules and then gradually introduce modules from a set of more advanced rules, which is neat. Inside the box, alongside the two rules books, you have a polystyrene insert housing six sets of five dragons. Bronze, green, red, silver, blue, and gold. You also have the components for a 3D tower, which houses the Dragonlance and includes six additional walls and six gates matching the colours of the dragons. There are hexagonal tokens representing flying citadels for use with the advanced rules. A deck of cards comprising 24 magic cards, which very disappointingly have no artwork. Six magic items, which have simple line art and six character cards that do thankfully have full colour art of the heroes and villains that will be duking it out for the titular lance. You also get two 10-sided dice and 150 white discs, the dreadful altitude markers. We will be talking about those later on. 
finally, you have the impressively large game board. And uh, I would say this board is a product of its time, but that would be doing a disservice to the time. Sure, it's functional, but it's workmanlike and bland. The flat colours and simplistic art just don't stand up to the other examples of the day and pale when compared to what Games Workshop were doing at the time and what HeroQuest would do shortly after. The best part is the cutaway for the tower and the punch holes that allow you to attach the fortress walls and the coloured gates, if you can get the damn things to stay in. Certainly, with the 3D elements in place and hordes of dragons flying about, the overall table presence is dramatically improved and it is easier to forgive the shortcomings of the board art. But still, come on. Surprisingly, the board art is also by Jeff Easley. Yes, the same Jeff Easley who painted that stunning box art. I can only assume he was working to a specification that required something utilitarian rather than beautiful. To get started, the rules tell you to put the board on a flat surface within reach of all players, just in case you were thinking of nailing it to the ceiling, and each player selects a colour of dragon to control. In two or three player games, you can even select to control more than one group of dragons if you wish to. And for the record, the dragons are technically divided into two teams. Bronze, silver and gold dragons are the rivals of the blue, green and red dragons, but in games with larger player counts, it's a free-for-all. For your first game, you will want to play the basic rules, in which all dragons are created equal. You arrange your five dragons on the starting spaces matching their colours, and the players dice off to determine who goes first, with play continuing clockwise. What ensues is a capture the flag star skirmish game with a heavy lean on movement, positioning and squad tactics. Your sole aim is to grab the lance and then return it to your lair to win. On a turn, a player must move, and may also take optional actions such as fighting and playing cards. To start, they roll a 10-sided dice to determine how many movement points they have, and they must use them all. On the roll of a 1 or 2, the player also draws a magic card just to balance the bad luck. Movement points can be spent on a single dragon or split between several. Knowing when and how to move dragons is obviously a big part of the strategy. Do you focus on one or two so they can do more, or do you activate as many as possible to give yourself more options? Whatever you choose, the movement itself is pretty straightforward. One movement point will move one dragon into an adjacent space, or will let one dragon climb or descend one level of altitude. And of course, a dragon's altitude is marked using the many, many, many altitude markers included with the game. These are... Ugh, I mean, these are probably the main reason the game doesn't get played more often. You stack them up under your dragon, using the pattern of pegs and recesses on the rim of each disc to connect them, and you get a very clear three-dimensional representation of where the dragons are in relation to each other. That's very clever. But, in practice, using the altitude markers is fiddly. They don't lock together well, they often topple over during play, and, it's fair to say, they aren't particularly attractive. It is not uncommon for players to spend a considerable amount of their time each turn adding or removing discs, carefully stacking them, trying to get the little pegs to connect, making sure they don't knock over adjacent dragons, and generally just dragging the pace of the game. My personal solution was to blue tack some of the discs together. I left some as singles, but also created prefix stacks of two and three discs, so they were less likely to collapse. It's not ideal, but it does help. Ultimately though, even if the discs fix together really well making the blue tack unnecessary, it would still be a painstaking process to add and remove each altitude marker, and it would still be a fiddly nuisance that adds a significant component bloat to an otherwise relatively streamlined game system. But if you can get past the fiddliness, it's a good idea. Dragons start at altitude 0 and must climb to at least altitude 1 to leave their lair. Then they can move in three-dimensional space as they desire, within limits. They can never finish their movement at an altitude in excess of 10. If they ever go to altitude 0 while they are outside of their lair, they crash and are removed from the game, and they can never enter a space containing another dragon, even if they are at a different altitude. One of the best things about the movement rules is a beautiful sense of flowing motion that helps to sell the idea that you are dealing with gigantic winged lizards that have mass and inertia. 
you must spend all of your movement points each turn. And while a dragon can ascend or descend multiple levels of altitude while staying in a single hex, they cannot both ascend and descend without advancing into a new space. In other words, you can't burn all of your movement points staying on one hex while maintaining your current altitude. It is possible for a dragon to maintain a holding pattern, you simply don't allocate it any movement points for that turn, but you will have to allocate those points somewhere, so at least one of your dragons is going to move from its original position. Additionally, a dragon cannot make a 180 degree turn to return to the hex it just left. It would need to make a circular route using at least three movement points to return to its starting location. As such, the basic game rules do an adequate job of creating the sense that the dragons are swooping and twirling around each other in a deadly dogfighting dance. The biggest issue I have with the movement is its roll and move. Admittedly, there is some degree of mitigation. You can divide your movement points between several dragons, for example, and if you roll poorly, you get a magic card. These cards are usually for use in combat, but some grant special movement abilities. Nevertheless, the fickle whims of fate can still easily scupper your best laid plans, bringing your glorious charge to a standstill. I think what makes it worse is you are usually rolling a single d10, which is going to produce results on a flat line. You have as much chance of rolling a 1 as you do a 10, and that makes it much harder to plan accordingly. At least with a 2d6 movement system, you would have a higher chance of a middling score, with really high and low scores being outliers. Obviously, a big part of the game is attacking rivals, and every dragon in your team is allowed to make an attack each turn if they are in a position to do so. To make an attack, a dragon must move into an adjacent hex to an opposing dragon at the same altitude. Often easier said than done. It's not uncommon to take several turns of pivoting, twisting and circling a foe before being able to engage. And combat, at least in the basic rules, is very straightforward. The attacker rolls a d10 and then adds one for each movement point the dragon used to get into an attack position, plus another five if that dragon is carrying the lance. Additionally, the attacker may choose to play one magic card. These magic cards are usually straightforward modifiers applied to the dice roll, so they aren't really all that exciting, but I do like that each type of dragon is immune to one of the spells. The defender then rolls a d10, playing a magic card of their own if they wish to, and adding 5 to the score if they have the lance. The results are then compared, with the winner being the player with the highest score. Where things get really clever is when you apply any damage from the combat. Dragons don't have hit points. Instead, the losing dragon must drop one level of altitude for each point of difference between the two scores. So if the winner scored 10 and the loser scored 6, the loser would drop 4 levels of altitude. If at any point a dragon hits 0 altitude, they pancake into the ground and will take no further part in the game. This is a little bit of genius baked into the system, for a number of reasons. Firstly, you don't need to worry about tracking hit points. That means no wound tokens or health dials. Great. Secondly, after the combat is resolved, with the exception of a draw, the dragons will be at different altitudes. The loser will be lower than the winner. This often prevents the defender from immediately retaliating, as they must first spend movement to get back into an attacking position. This keeps that sense of exciting freewheeling motion, and stops combats from developing into mundane tit-for-tat battles between two immovable foes. Thirdly, you can tell at a glance exactly how close a dragon is to death. The one soaring at altitude 10 probably isn't going to be worth the effort, but that dragon skimming the treetops, now that's an appealing target. And you could say, well that's ridiculous, all the dragons will immediately climb as high as possible to make sure there is no risk. But that's part of what makes the system great. There is an inherent element of risk and reward in everything you do, and that extends to picking an altitude to fly at. Sure, you can spend all your movement climbing one of your dragons to a high altitude for safety, but if you are doing that, you aren't moving the rest of your team. And crucially, you aren't closing the distance to the Dragonlance. Waste too much time climbing, and you are just inviting a rival to skim along at altitude 1 and snatch the lance before you even descend to the same level to contest it. And it should also be noted, a dragon has to be at altitude 4 or lower to enter the tower courtyard, which they must do by going through a gate matching their team colour. 
So at some point, there's going to be a bundle at a precarious height, and some dragons will take a dirt nap. If a dragon should get through the correct gate, they must ascend to the top of the tower at altitude 10 to snag the lance, which gets plugged into the hole on their back. Another great example of how the physical components in Dragonlance are used to define the state of play on the tabletop in a visual, instantly understandable way. Alas, a lance on your back is just a target by another name, because during your final push to get the lance back to your own lair, every other player is going to be gunning for you. When attacking a dragon that is holding the lance, a player may choose to make a normal attack or else attempt to steal the lance, often a difficult feat to handle. The Lancer will already gain plus 5 to their dice roll, but they will gain an additional plus 3 if another player is attempting to take the Lance from them, and that gives them a total of 8. That's before they even consider using a Magic card. Additionally, should the attacker successfully snatch the Lance, the loser does not lose any levels of altitude. In effect, the attacker foregoes inflicting damage to instead take possession of the Lance. Of course, if they prefer, the attacker can make a regular attack, forcing the Lancer to crash, which will remove that dragon from the game and magically teleport the Lance back to the tower for another dragon to take. Admittedly, this bash the leader mechanism can become tiresome. Some games do stretch out if the Lance keeps changing hands or players with the Lance suffer a series of unfortunate rolls. Conversely, that same mechanism can generate gripping final battles, with dragons from multiple factions swooping and diving on each other in a maelstrom of gigantic flapping wings as the lance is won and lost and each player desperately attempts to make the final dash for home. It is in those moments of pure chaos and ancient dragonborn rage that the theme lands and the game takes off. And that is basically it. It's an accessible game with lightweight strategies and a fun toy factor. Really, only let down by the fiddliness of manipulating the altitude discs and a little too much chaos in the movement and combat systems. Unfortunately, with just two players, everything seems a bit too spread out and you lose a lot of the tension. It feels more like a race than a battle, and a series of poor rolls for movement can be devastating. While that can be resolved by letting each player control more than one set of dragons, I think it's better to round up a group of people who enjoy lightweight dice chuckers and take that gameplay. With a full complement of six players, things get really fast and frenetic. It takes longer for your turn to come around, but you are always involved in the action and there is always something going on. You never feel safe and you are never too far from a dragon that wants to take a chunk out of you. But of course, more players does mean the game takes more time to complete and you may find you want to drop one or two dragons from each team to tighten up the pacing. Overall, I think there is enough in the basic rules to keep players entertained. But if you are looking for something more, if you like your skirmish games with a little more depth and tactical nuance, Dragonlance includes a second rules book containing the optional advanced rules. And what I really love about these is they are completely modular, so you can add them all or simply pick and choose the ones you like while disregarding the rest. Characters, I feel, are essential. There is one character for each colour of dragon and they lend their team some much needed personality by introducing a unique ability that all the dragons of their colour will share. The Flying Citadels are also a fun addition to regular games. They circle the central tower following the indicated route, and during gameplay a dragon can land on a citadel and search it in hopes of finding a magical item. The reverse of each citadel token shows a unique item, three for good players and three for evil players. If one of your dragons finds a usable item, you return the citadel to the board and take the relevant magic item reference card. Unfortunately, items can only be used by the dragon carrying them, and there is no easy way to mark which dragon has an item. As a dragon cannot have a magic item and the lance at the same time, it would have been nice to have six plastic weapon pieces that could be attached to the dragons, and the fact you don't get anything like that in the game box feels like a bit of an oversight. The third rule that I think is worth adding early, if not immediately, relates to terrain. There are three types of terrain, forests, mountains and water. Forests and mountains act exactly like the ground, except they are at altitude 2 and 4 respectively. Their presence increases the number of crashes and gives you something else to think about as you manoeuvre. Meanwhile, water will break a dragon's fall. When the dragon reaches altitude 0, they simply miss a turn and can then get back into the action. 
For me, the rest of the advanced rules start layering on complications that transition the game from something lightweight and frothy into something a bit crunchier. There are rules for more realistic movement, where a dragon can only turn up to 60 degrees for each hex it enters, and can only ascend or descend as it moves through those hexes. Plus, there are special aerial manoeuvres like loops, barrel rolls, power climbs, wheels, and dives. Incidentally, when Games Workshop released Aeronautica, I was surprised by how similar the rules felt compared to Dragonlands. It was a dogfight played on a hex grid, offering all the same kinds of manoeuvres and with the same focus on altitude. It just swapped out dragons for fighter jets. But that's besides the point. Hand in hand with the advanced movement rules are the advanced combat rules, which grant additional bonuses to dragons that dive bomb their foes or loop behind to strike an opponent's unprotected back. It's all good stuff, making the game surprisingly thinky, and for people craving something juicier to sink their teeth into, these rules are going to be of significant value. The advanced rules can certainly level up the rather humdrum two-player experience. But I have found the more of the advanced rules I add, the more the game drifts away from the experience I'm looking for from this particular title. This is a big, dumb, chaotic game to play with a big, dumb, chaotic group, and I love it as that for that. If I wanted to play something with a greater level of strategic depth, I probably wouldn't pick a game system where your cleverly thought out plans can be scuppered by a bad movement roll on a d10. But to be clear, part of the value of this game is how easy it is to modify. At the back of the advanced rules there is a section of alternative game modes and ideas for other homebrew variants, and the designers invite players to mix, match and make their own. Ultimately, this is a game that wants you to have fun. It wants you to play your way, and to use this framework as a starting point for limitless adventure. Because this is a game from the days of high adventure in Worlds of Magic, when everybody made their games their own, and we all were fearless. From the days when fledgling heroes were exploring new realms of possibilities, when we were adventurers delving in arcane lore and carving out our own paths, when new stories were being forged in the fires of Dragon's Breath, and imagination soared. But that is it from me for now. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please consider pressing the like button. If you really like this video, please consider subscribing if you don't already do so. And hopefully, I will see you all again very soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.